Tuesday morning. Stand, please. The reading of God's Word. Far come forward. This morning we'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 45, verses 21 to 23. That's Isaiah 45, 21 to 23. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord? There is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall take an oath. Let's pray. Father, we look to you in this new year, that you will work on our hearts as we read and study your word, that we will understand that you have determined all things, that you have called the end from the beginning, that we can rest even in the hopelessness of our culture, that we can rest even in the poor decisions of a government that was given an incredible amount of grace and mercy in designing our government, our country, centuries ago. Lord, we pray that, that our leaders at every level will understand that their only duty is to exalt righteousness, your righteousness. And Lord, you have given us your wisdom. Lord, we pray that somehow our leaders will find Proverbs chapter 8 and read about wisdom and its source. And it's fruit. It's the return on the investment when people invest in wisdom. And Lord, we pray that, that your son will soon return and that he will place a kingdom on this earth. A physical, literal, political kingdom that exalts nothing but righteousness because he will rule and every knee will bow. And every time we'll confess that he is Lord. We thank you for the grace that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. Let's turn in our hymn book to number 401, 401. Church is one foundation.
strings. Less beetle pies than five.
to turn your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Come on now.
also another thing to remember as we go through, because Paul is using these terms to describe his people, he's not using these terms to describe their spiritual level. In other words, you could be weak and be a carnal or a spiritual Christian. You could be strong and be a carnal or a spiritual Christian. He's not saying that a weak Christian is, 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 a, is a, a bad, um, fleshly, carnal Christian, and a strong Christian is a mature, spiritual uh, Christian. And that's not it at all. And it's, it's important to understand that. Hopefully you'll see that as we go through. Also, he's dealt with this subject in other places in the New Testament, and he's very gentle here in this passage. And yet he's very challenging and, and, and harsh and direct in, in other passages like in Galatians and Colossians. And why is that? Because in Galatians and Colossians, when he's talking about people that observe Sabbath and observe dietary laws, they're, they're being told that they have to do those things in order to be Christians. If they don't do those things, they can't be Christians. And, and Paul wants them to understand under no circumstances is that ever true. That is false. And he's direct. And anytime you're dealing with salvation, Paul gets very direct and very clear with his language. He doesn't beat around the bush. But here, that's not the, that's not the um, subcontext. All these people are Christians. They're not talking about doing these things or not doing these things in order to be Christians. Um, that's not, that's not the issue. So he's very gentle here in this context. <clears throat> but he does want to address it. The reason why he wants to address it is it because it falls in the greater context of everything that he's talked about through this letter all the way through. If you want to find one common theme that goes all the way through Romans, and hopefully most of you have been here with us through the entire study. He's covered a lot of ground. But the connecting theme through the whole thing, all the way back to chapter 1, verse 16, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Remember him saying that? All the way through, he has, has addressed that there's these two different groups in the church of Rome. The Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews and the Gentiles. And his hope and his reason for writing this letter is so that these two groups will cooperate. That they'll fully embrace one another as equals in Christ. That there are no divisions in the church. That these people are all on equal footing before the Lord. And it kind of comes to a climax here in chapter 14. Is that important? Is that important that they cooperate? Is that important that they don't have divisions and judgments within their congregation? Well, let's see what Jesus said. Let's just pause just for a minute and go with me, if you would, back to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. <coughs> verses. It starts off, it says, at the same time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child and said and unto him and set him in the midst of them and said unto them, verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as, this, as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoso therefore humbled himself as this little child, saying that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Alright, so to begin with, you have to address this right off the bat. Hopefully, if you, if you study the Bible, you understand what he's talking about here. He is not talking about his love for children. Now, does he love children? Of course he does. He loves all children, he loves all humans. But the subject here is an illustration. 
he takes a little child and sets him in the middle of this, this group of disciples for a teaching opportunity. He's saying that believers, you and me, Christians, are like this child. In other words, they have to be taken care of, they have to uh, uh, they, they, they have to be fed, they have to be clothed, they have to be housed, they can't do that for themselves. They can't go out and plow the field, grow their own food, catch the fish on the lake, and bring them home and clean them. Well, some, some of our little guys back there probably know how to do those things. But on a typical scale, kids can't take care of themselves. They have to depend on somebody to take care of them. And that's where we are as Christians. There's no pecking order. We have to humble ourselves to come before the Lord. We can't come before the Lord on our own merits. We didn't do anything to earn that right. And we have to fully trust that God will save us and will provide for us and take care of us and bring us to glory. Amen? Amen. So it's an illustration. It's an illustration. But let's go on and see what he says about this. Verse 6. Here's the reason why I wanted you to come here. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it would be better for him to have a millstone hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. That's a, that's a pretty great statement there. That's how he feels about you. And you. And you. You are precious to the Lord because you are his child. Yeah. Precious. And anybody that would dare harm you, he's going to know it, he's going to mark it, he's going to recognize it, and if that person doesn't become a believer, he's going to be judged for that. He goes on, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto that man by whom the offense comes. In other words, you and I are in a world. And the world's going to treat us the way the world treats us. Because it's the world. It's, it's owned and run by Satan. And, and those people are going to be judged for what they do to us. It goes on to say, If thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them off from thee. It is better for thee to enter into light, all main, rather than having two hands or two feet. Be cast into the everlasting fire. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. Better is it for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. So, he, he's, again, this is a, an illustration. He's not telling people to do those things. He's saying, take drastic means to make sure that you enter into heaven. Take drastic means. It's that important, it's that vital that you do that, come to the knowledge of repentance. Then he goes back to verse 10, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. That right there is where people get the idea that you have a guardian angel. You do. Take in just for a moment what he's saying there. The angels in heaven are, are fixated on the face of God in case they need to be dispatched to go to our aid. What a cool symbolism there. I mean, that's real. It's happening right now, right at this moment. The angels can see if you or I are in trouble, but they won't go do what they know they can do unless they're dispatched. Do it. And they're waiting eagerly. Lord, look at that. You go take care of that. Send me. Send me. I want to go do that. They are the servants of God on our behalf. There's your guardian name. And, and we don't know. You and I don't know how many times they were been dispatched on each of our cases. It could have been done many, many times already because many times we're unaware that these things are actually happening all around us. But what I want you to see here is the level of care that God has for his children and love and how precious you are to him. So Paul's 
picking up on that theme over here. Go back to our text now. So, is it important that he cares about whether or not I hurt your feelings? He does. Does he care whether or not you, you judge somebody else as to whether or not they're doing right or wrong? Yeah, he does. He cares. Alright, so let's begin to work through this. We're going to go quickly through the first part because we've already gone through it before. Him that is weak in the faith received ye. He starts off addressing the weak from the from the standpoint of the strong, the strong of the ye here in this verse. So he's he's talking to the strong. So he's saying the strong in the faith, those that understand their freedom in Christ, those that have come to that understanding, receive the weak. And, and the word here is the P-R-O-S prophase on the word receive, which, which intensifies it, means fully receive. Don't hold anything back. Fully receive the weak. And then he goes on to qualify that, but not to doubtful disputations. What that means is don't feign receive, or don't, don't, don't act like you're just bringing a man and, and putting your arm around him just so you can start a fight. Just so you can tell them where they're wrong, just so you can tell them how silly they are, how they don't understand their freedom in Christ, and, and then you do, and you're, you're there to just set them straight. Don't do that. Don't do that. Fully receive them as they are, as children of the Lord. Verse 2, For one believeth that he may eat all things, he who is weak eateth herbs. We went through this uh, before in some detail. Um, this could be a Jew or a Gentile. It, it doesn't matter. If it's a Jew, it's somebody who you, you, you come to a, a, a fifth Sunday meeting and we're all having barbecue pork sandwiches that day. And if you're a Jew here at this at this meeting, you would say, I can't eat that because it's pork. And it's it's forbidden in the Jewish dietary laws. So that would be the Jew. But if you're a a uh, uh, a Gentile here and you choose not to eat, then you would have been somebody who has come out of paganism where they have um, sacrificed any kind of meat to a certain idol. And then the next day, that meat has found its way out of the marketplace, and it could have been bought by you and then brought to the fifth Sunday. And then just by chance, you don't know whether it was or whether it wasn't, but there's a chance that it could have been offered to an idol, and your conscience won't let you eat that because it, it's been offered to an idol. So you abstain. You don't eat. So in either case, it could be a Jew or a Gentile here who chooses not to eat. In verse 2, one believes that he may eat all things, that's the strong, and the other who is weak, eateth herbs. So if you came to that fifth Sunday, and you were that Jew or that Gentile, you would just eat the salad. And, 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 and skip on the meat. Verse 3. Let not him that eateth, so you're the strong, despise him that eateth not. And let him which eateth not judge him that eat it. For God has received him. Alright, so let's just work through this just a little bit. In other words, he that, again, he that eateth knows that it's okay. 1 Timothy 4 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Here it is. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. In other words, there's nothing prohibitive in diet today. Yes, there was a time in the Old Testament that there, there was a, a, a time when they had to eat or not eat certain things, but that was for a specific purpose. It has nothing to do with us today. Christians can eat anything. Anything that won't. That, that's good for you. It's not rotten or whatever, of course. Even, even cake. Yeah. <laughs> that's probably not good for you either. 
So despise and judge here, these two words. This group's not to despise this group, this group's not to judge this group. These words are similar in meaning, but they have a little bit of distinction. To despise means to look down as worthless or with contempt. Most of Jews in that day that weren't Christians, most Jews all despised Gentiles. They looked at them like they were less of people. They were not even uh, real people. They, they despised them. They were, they were unclean people as a people group. And, by the way, that feeling was mutual. Gentiles, Roman citizens, Gentiles felt the same way about Jews. They thought they were disgusting, they thought they were backwards, they thought they, they didn't want anything to do with them. So, the feel, feeling was mutual. But in Christ, in the church, most would have um, overcome that sentiment. Because of who they are in Christ, and what Christ has done for them through grace, that, that feeling... Uh, was not evident in the church. Just like it's not here. We have people from all kinds of races, backgrounds, cultures that come here together. We shouldn't and, and don't, I believe, have those overhanging things in our church. But, sometimes they are under the surface. A little bit. A little bit because of your background. And then all it takes is just one that's really overt. One bad apple spoils a whole bunch. If we have one person here that, that displays those kinds of feelings like somebody else is beneath them or unworthy for whatever reason. Could be money, could be uh, race, could be religious background, could be north-south. It could be lots of things. Amen? We don't, we don't look down on anybody for any of those things, or shouldn't. Amen? Amen? And if you do, it's a problem. Now judge, on the other hand, judge, Crino, the weak looking at the strong, they, they are looking at them like they're lawbreakers. Now again, who are the weak? The weak are the ones that say, I have to observe certain days, I have to observe certain diets, and, and so they're looking at them like they are, uh, they're too loose. They're too loose in their living. They just, they just live any way they want to. You know? They judge them as, as lawbreakers and potential criminals before God's law. Both of those attitudes are wrong. The strong considers the weak legalistic and self-righteous. In other words, they, they, this group over here that has free in Christ, they look at them over there, and they they think that because they're doing those things that they're better than. Does that make sense? We call those people legalists. That was like the scribes and the Pharisees. They thought they were better than you because they did everything perfectly according to the law. And then they, the weak look at the strong as irresponsible at best and profligate at worst. looking for trouble. Like they have a license to sin. Now, each of these situations can be a little nuanced. It's not cut and dry, because either of these accusations actually could be true. In the church it shouldn't be, and, and most of the time it's not, but it could be. It could be that the strong is looking over there at the weak saying, they think they're better than me because they do those things. Whereas the weak may actually be thinking that. The weak may be thinking, well, I don't eat those things, so I'm a little better than you. Or I observe the Sabbath. I don't work on Saturday. I don't play on Saturday. For us, it would be, a lot of people think it's Sunday. A lot of people think that the Christian Sabbath is Sunday. Like, well, he went to church and then went straight out to the golf course. And he's not observing the day of, of the Lord like he should, you know, or he went out on his boat right after church. Man, I mean, he hit that parking lot, he was gone. And 
And again, this person looking at that guy and thinking, I'm better than that. Because I, I observed the whole day. If I'm not working in the garden or doing anything, I just sat on the couch. I didn't even turn on the TV and watch football. Because I'm a, I'm a, so you can see where those, those feelings may creep in. And then this guy over here, he's doing the same thing. Where he has freedom in Christ. He's looking over there saying, yeah, that guy, that guy's too loose. And he may be right. This guy may be using his freedom in Christ for a license to actually go too far. He has no boundaries. He actually is doing things beyond what he should be. Remember me telling you about the, the guy years ago that he came to me and he knew just enough scripture to be dangerous. He, he, had, he started into an argument with me about how tithing is not a biblical thing for the church to do. So again, I got into that debate with him and I, and I said, oh, okay, I understand where you're coming from. And technically, you're right. I don't teach tithing for our New Testament church. But giving is a principle based on tithing, but you do it by grace, as God has prospered you, you, through reading your scriptures, and through prayer, give what you think God has laid on your heart to give. It's not a percentage. I don't, I don't get down to the calculator and figure out 10% of my net income to be able to figure out how much money I'm going to put back there. But it's based on that principle, but I have freedom to be able to give more if I want than 10%. So when you understand, my point was that that man, because he felt like he was right, gave zero. Did that come from a heart that wanted to honor God? No. That came from a heart that wanted to be right and cared nothing about honoring God. Right. Does that make sense? So that's, that's where this guy is looking at that guy and saying he took his freedom too far. He did. He took his freedom too far. <clears throat> and then here's the real thing that I want you to see in verse 3. At the end of all that banter back and forth and all that nuance that we're Pastor Dan is you, this is the part you got to get. The last line, for God has received him. This guy has to understand that no matter where he's coming from over there, he's a child of God. Yeah. And this guy over here has to understand that no matter what his differences are over there that I just can't understand or I can't get, he's a child of God. Yeah. And if God has received him, then, then I need to receive him. Fully, fully receive him. Not holding anything back. And that's how God receives us, not holding anything back. When you and I came to Christ for redemption, for salvation, He didn't look at the, the rest of the Trinity and say, you know, there's Brother Ken repent today. Like we've been hoping He would all this time. He finally came down to the altar and repented of His sins and, and, and made His, his uh, profession of faith public. And we're so glad that He did that. Now we're going to start a good probation period for Him. And we're going to start watching him and make sure he lines up right. We're going to make sure that he's going to church every week. And we're going to look and see if he's doing everything right for a while. We may upgrade him to uh, child first class. And then if we watch him for a few years and he keeps doing the right things and we're looking at all the, and seeing the right results, we may make him a corporal and, and make him a little closer to a full-fledged child of God. No, no, no. That's not the way God does it, is it? He fully receives us on day one as fully his child. And that's the way you and I need to be with these different factions in our congregation. Even though they look at things a little bit differently. Now we're talking about preferences here. And that's important. We're not talking about sinfulness. That's a whole different subject. Hopefully we'll touch on that in a few minutes. But if you like, if you like brown carpet, if you like green carpet, that's okay. If you like to read, uh, if you like the, the hymns out of the white book, if you like the hymns out of the blue book because they're a little more modern, that's okay. I'm still fully received. 
Amen? I fully accept you. Whether you like the Sundays where we play the piano, or would you like the Sundays where we play the guitar, it's okay. Yeah. I, I'm a piano guy, but I'll always see I'm going to That's what Kevin's done. He's talking his head back <laughs>
short section here. This last line in verse 5, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Paul MacArthur says, in matters that are not specifically commended, commanded or forbidden in Scripture, it is always wrong to go against conscience, because our conscience represents what we actually believe to be right. To go against our conscience, therefore, is to do that which we believe is wrong. And although an act or practice in itself may not be sinful, it is treated as sinful for those who are convinced in their own minds that it is wrong and it produces guilt. It is also sinful, however, to try to impose our personal convictions on others, because in doing so, we are tempted, tempting them to go against their own consciences. Consciences. Paul is therefore giving a twofold command. Do not compromise your own conscience in order to conform to the other conscience of an other believer, and do not attempt to lead another believer to compromise his conscience to conform to yours. Does that make sense? Verses 8 and 9. Whether we live, we live under the Lord, whether we die, we die in the Lord, because we live, therefore, die with the Lord. This end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord living, both of the dead and the living. We are Christ's purchased possession as his children. 1 Corinthians 6 20, 1 Corinthians 7 23, Acts 20 28, Ephesians. 1 7, Colossians 1 14, all places in the New Testament where it says Christ bought you and bought me. He paid a price to own you and to own me. His work, living, dying, reviving, raising from the dead, was in order to purchase a people. That makes him our Lord. Lord. Capital L. The most common greeting in the first century among Christians was Jesus is Lord. Let me just say that. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Jesus is Lord. Our overall motive in everything is to please Him. It's not what we do and don't do, it's always an eye towards pleasing our Lord and obeying our Lord. And at death, according to our context, we do that here while we live, but we know when we die, as Christians, we know when we die, that all we're doing is changing the phase of how we serve our Lord. We're going from serving Him in this phase as a living, temporal being here, to serving Him in the next phase, which is a spiritual being on the other side. Our relationship to Him doesn't change. He's still our Lord. One note here while I'm here, y'all know I say this all the time, but it bears repeating. The idea that someone can be saved and not walk in obedience to sanctification is foreign to Scripture. Right? In other words, somebody you might hear somebody say sometimes, well, well, he's saved, you know, even though he hasn't been in church in 18 years, and, and he, he goes to the bar, you know, every Friday night, and he, he cheats on his wife, and, he, and he, yeah, he does all these things. He does nothing that looks Christian, sounds Christian, doesn't read his Bible, doesn't pray. But he prayed a prayer one time when he was eight years old. I was there that day. And then they're arguing that that guy's a Christian and he's, you know, 45 years old today. 99% chance that is false. Amen? The scripture talks about. Not only is Jesus Christ your Savior, He is your Lord. Amen. Amen. He is your Lord. You prove that that actually happened, that saving event happened by the way you live your life. Alright? I think most of you get that here. I think most of you do that here. But I want you to be... Why is that so important? Because listen, beloved, if you're trusting that thing you did when you were eight 
I'm trusting the fact that God's given me the power to walk in obedience today. Scripture always says, know whether you're a Christian or not. Is Here's how you do it. You look at your feet. You don't look back at an event. Scripture never says, go back and look and remember an event. Right. It always says, look and see what your feet are doing right now. And your heart is doing right now. And that will tell you whether or not your kids are not. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. You get that? Okay. That's how you know what you're saying. Are you being led every day before you go to sleep at night to stop and take a moment and repent your sin? That's what Christians do. Most people don't ever do that. Most people don't stop at the end of every day to remember and take inventory of their sins and commit themselves once again to the cross. Only Christians do that. And by the way, Christians do that every day because why? We sin every day. Never can get away from that. And that's not in this life. We're going to sin and be disobedient every day. There is no perfect walks here on this side of glory. Only Jesus. All right, let's move on. We've got a few minutes. Verses 10 through 13. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stone in the block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. This is the result of what he just said. You don't answer to me. I don't answer to you for my actions or for what I believe. I answer to him. The admonition Paul is giving here is that the body of Christ needs to be a loving, encouraging, relationship fostering arena. Let's get that. Again, we're talking about um, preferences, amoral, not ethical, not moral, not sinful actions, choices, preferences. But I can I can take that too far. If I were to say to you, you shouldn't buy a boat. Christians should not own a boat. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because, well, you may buy that boat, and you like it so much, you may choose to go use that boat on Sunday. And that would lead you to sin. So I'm, I'm preempting that and saying, if you just don't buy the boat, you won't miss church. And you won't sin. Now, I may have good intentions by doing that, but it's wrong for me to say that. It's wrong for me to do that. Some of you may remember this. It happened in Southern Baptist Church, and it happened in a lot of churches I was in, Missionary Baptist, and then Fundamental Baptist. Some of the churches I would join as a member, if you come in after you walk the aisle and ask to be a member of the church, they would give you a sheet of paper, it's called Church Covenant. And in that Church Covenant, they would say things like, I agree never to be involved in the sale, purchase, or consumption of alcohol. I never, I agree never to play cards, dance, go to the movies. Uh, roll dice, um, all, all these these things. Well, their intentions may have been thinking that those things are leading to simple practices, but here's the problem. None of those things are, are forbidden in Scripture. Smoking, chewing back, those things were also on those covenant things. Can't do any of those things. Now, what are they doing? Now, in doing that, are they the weaker brother or the stronger brother? Weaker. They're the weaker brother. Right. They're the ones that are saying, I do this, I do that, I do that, and it makes me a better Christian. Whereas the person over here can understand that, you know what, he can have a glass of wine with a, a meal and not sin. 
But here's the part that's that's important. You gotta draw boundaries around yourself over here. You have to be led by the Holy Spirit to know what your own limitations are and boundaries are that could go. Playing cards. Let me give you an example. Chrissy and I watched uh, some KDL last night. Old John Wayne movie. And uh, one of the characters is uh, John Wayne, John's younger brother. I think his name's Matt in the movie. Played by Dean Martin. Uh-huh. And uh, he's, a, he's a scoundrel. And he's always trying to look for a fast buck in the way around. And, you know, he's a gambler. And he always carries a pack of cards with him. So he came in to settle up his mother's account, and the guy says, okay, you owe me $6.50. And he put a thing of cards down and says, okay, I, I cut it in half, and he kind of doubles it. You know, and he's, he's trying to cheat his way so he can get out of paying. All right, so in other words, he's using cards in a way that is simple. Amen? But you and I can use cards in a way that is honorable and 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 and. and, and uh, enhances time of fellowship together and is, is entertainment good wholesome. We can get together and have to play rummy or peanut or whatever. And, you know, there's no there's no stakes on there. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Amen. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that at all. So it's wrong for me to paint those boundaries around you, like John Carter was saying. I am imposing my conscience on you by saying. You can't do any of these things. I need to trust you. Here's the way I wrote it. And these are the three points that Paul makes in this section. Those that are saved belong to God. Those that are saved belong to God. They're His precious possession. We have to trust that God is able to keep that which has been committed to Him. And the believer's minds are fixed upon his lordship, and that we have to give a personal account to him personally of what we do here. It's all about where we are related to the Lord. You don't give your account to me, you don't belong to me, you're not led by me, you're not empowered by me, therefore it's wrong of me to tell you what you can and can't do that may or may not lead you to sin. My job is to teach you the scriptures so that you'll have the equipment to be able to make that decision with your own spirit that dwells your heart and your own knowledge of the scriptures and your own walk with the Lord. That's how you walk the path. Amen? It's not by hearing my voice in your head when you're walking down the street. It's by hearing the Lord's voice in your head. Through the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Right? So, if all that garbage is out of the way, when we come to church, what do we have left? We have what Paul wants us to have. We have a, a community that's based on positive, loving, serving encouragement of each other. That's what it should be. That's how we become an effective church. That's how we do what we're supposed to be doing. That's how people in the world get saved, because we, they see us as a body of loving believers together. Satan's trying to divide that. Satan's trying to get you to think, look what that guy's doing. You need to go tell him not to do that. You need to tell her that she shouldn't be doing that. Right? That's not what God wants. God wants us to leave those things up to him, and us to be doing the right things. It's a positive thing. say something real quick? Yes, sir. Um, this week, I actually ran into that very same thing. Um, Leslie and I were riding our motorcycles, and we stopped at a little cafe. And so Leslie and I were just sitting down, we were talking about Jesus, and the lady my mind that says, oh, you said Jesus? I said, well, well yes, I did. She says, oh, well, he's going to be coming soon, and uh, by the way, you need to pray really hard about the food you're getting. 
don't know. I'm like, okay. And then she says, well, God told me audibly, she really said that, um, of this thing. I want to share it with you. I said, okay. I'll do that. Let's hear it. I'm James. And she says, you shouldn't have a Christmas tree. I said, oh, I shouldn't have a Christmas tree. Well, yeah, it says in Jeremiah that they took the Christmas, or they took the evergreens, they cut them, and they, they nailed them to something. I said, that. okay, well, um, so you're saying I shouldn't have a Christmas tree because of that. Yes, yes, it's worshiping you know, the, the Christmas tree. I said, oh, and she says, and when you get the presents underneath, you actually bow them down and, and worship the tree when you get the presents underneath. Tree. Oh. And I listened to it for a few minutes. I said, You haven't changed my mind. And then the man that was with her, he says, Well, if I was to put a statue of Buddha on my desk, uh, should I do that? I said, No, you shouldn't do that. He says, Well, what's the difference? I said, Well, Buddha is something that we would worship right now. I said, The Christmas tree isn't being worshiped. And so they uh, they kept going on and on, and they got hostile. <laughs> they got hostile with Leslie and I. And finally, I I said, you know, worship is a conscious action. You have to actually think about what you're doing when you're worshiping something. You know, I I, I told them I said, there's a chair. If you said at one point that someone worshiped that chair, and I would be wrong to sit in that chair. Then, then I think you're, you're, you're wrong. And then, you know, I, I actually talked about some of the, not just one particular scripture, but other scriptures that address it. And, um, well, they weren't real happy with me. But, A, be careful about anybody who says they've heard a word from the Lord. Honestly. Uh, B, this is that situation where I told them exactly what Paul said. He says, you know, if, I said, if you don't want the tree, that's fine. For me, for my household, I'm going to have a tree, and I'm going to have a very big tree out here. <laughs> if I'm really the wrong person to say don't have the Christmas tree. <laughs> but I just, I had thought I'd share that. We yeah, I appreciate that. that. I mean, but you weren't on the same level. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. She actually said that. I said, um, so you don't hear, she says, well, you can't really compare to me. I said, well, why is that? Well, because God speaks to me audibly. I said, oh, you're on a higher level. And she says, well, actually, yes, I'm on a higher level. <laughs> wow. Thanks. Oh, well, well, you're uh, Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to have a song of invitation. I'm going to invite Brother Bill to come up. Thank you so much, Kevin, for sharing. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I do want to say, you know, there are, there, there are times that you and I may have to talk to somebody about sin. Um, but it's going to be something, because if you ever heard somebody say, well, you can't judge me. Judge not, you can judge. Okay. Right, have you heard that before, Matthew? Uh, Matthew 7. So here's the thing. If I come to you and, and, and talk to you, not you, but anybody, about, let's, let's say they uh, committed a vote. The fact is, I'm not judging. I'm just exposing what God has already judged you doing. Understand? So, if you're going to judge somebody's sin, not playing cards or dancing, then you better be able to go to chapter and verse and say, God says that's forbidden. And you better be able to say to that person and let the word speak the truth to their heart. If it really is sin that somebody's caught up in, you should do that, but you really don't need to, because God put His heart law on people's hearts, and and you, all you have to do is expose it, and and, and they're going to know it's wrong. They're going to. And that's how you and I got saved. Amen. No, nobody had to come to us and give us a laundry list of all the things that we did wrong in our life. All they had to do was expose the fact that God knew it was wrong, and you know it's wrong, and if you don't repent of it. You're going to pay the own price for your own sin. And you don't want that. That's what it looks like. It's, 
everlasting hell, wrath of God. Right? So I just wanted to throw that in. Thank you, Kevin. But there, there, there is a time you may have to confront somebody about sin, but it's a clearly defined sin in God's word. It's not your opinion or my opinion or your preference or my preference. It's a clearly defined sin. All right. Let's have a time of interpretation. Stand if you would. Four hundred thirty-seven. Four hundred thirty-seven. Send the light. Thank <laughs> you. 